I'm going to cover three topics this morning. Uh, some is going to be redundant, and uh, you're going to see as we go through today a lot of overlap in some of the, uh, the observations I may have with others. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the market share of what LCOs as lawn care operators in the lawn care industry. Potential water quality risk, this is what we're, we're here to discuss today. I'm going to talk about some of the things that we see in our observations. I'm going to kind of echo what uh, Bruce mentioned that they're seeing the DIY market. And then I was asked to share what we are doing around our environmental stewardship program. If you look at uh, the research facts, and I'm not certain we're buying the same studies or not, Bruce, but there is a lot of studies, and, and we bring a new marketing guy, he's got to redo all the work. And basically what we're finding out consistently over the last 20 years is that only one in two households in the U.S. actually does anything with the outside landscape of their property. We're very much in alignment with what uh, Bruce said, about 80% of the market is do-it-yourself. So we're really dealing with 20% you know, of the balance of that, or about you know, one lawn in 10 is actually used in a professional lawn care service. Now the thing that is a little bit different from uh, the do-it-yourself is that we'll stretch out a service over a course of a season. And we are making four to six applications per year. But the assumption is that, well, that must mean they're putting down you know, six times as much fertilizer, and that's not the case. By having the opportunity to be on a lawn more frequently, we've adjusted our rates. 10, 15 years ago, we were at the higher levels of, of uh, university recommendations, somewhere between five pounds. And I remember a time when it used to be higher than that because everyone was promoting late fall fertility. Trouble is, is he calls it spring loss. Buying behavior, consumer's interest in lawn is a spring phenomenon. If, if you don't believe that, just go into a lawn and garden center in the spring for those critical six weeks, and then come back to a garden center in the fall or a large uh, uh, big box store, and look at the percentage of uh, outside storage associated with lawn and garden plants. The nursery industry tried to do falls for planting and have not been very effective. So it is a spring phenomenon. But we are balancing out our aquarium, and where we once had five pounds, we're down about three to three and a half pounds when we know that the lawn's in pretty good shape. If you want to look at this thing, we're talking about watersheds, we need to kind of put things in perspective. Now, you may argue with the numbers, but just from a, a perspective, assume a 1,000 home subdivision, typically lot size is about a fifth of an acre. I got it up here, thanks, Bruce. And our studies show lawn sizes will be larger on the East Coast, smaller in the Midwest, and extremely small as you go out west. So we use in our business about a 6,000 square foot lawn size average. Now remember, as we said, the watershed area, on that 8,500 square foot, you've got to back out the roofing, you have to back out the driveway, and then as we uh, earlier speaker said, you have to be able to get to a subdivision. So you've got to figure out the hardscape associated with uh, streets and sidewalks in that area. So if you run some math assumptions, the lawn area is about 65% of the total a mass of land in a subdivision, but if only 50% of homeowners are actually doing something on the lawn, really only about 69 out of the 211 acres in this model here actually has inputs of lawn fertilizers or the other lawn products into that potential watershed. So, you know, the balance is, I think, what uh, uh, Bruce was saying is we've got to put the potential risk in perspective. And we can't just assume in a watershed that everything is being treated and that all of the area that watershed is a lawn that has an impact. So obviously our concern is surface water runoff, stormwater management in these urban suburban environments. And we know that everything is going to eventually find its way downstream and into a larger body of water. And I think that is the concern we all have about it. And the, the values, the economic values of, of water quality are important to all of us. When I look at some of the things, and it's kind of pretty much in perspective, I rank the risk very similar to Bruce. One, accidental infield spills. A, a, a load of fertilizer accidentally dropping off a truck onto a hard surface that isn't recognized. Off-target placement of applications. And then obviously, when I hear from uh, two speakers later today, is really the actual from a, a correct application to that lawn site, how much potential is there for surface runoff of those products once applied? So, action steps that are in place for accidental uh, spills, it's all education. You know, driver training, when you feel we have 5,000 route managers out on the road every day, driver training is extremely important to us. Changing work environment, 
getting people are not used to coming out of an agrarian based business and into our business and putting them behind the wheel of a, of a truck that may have a, a 6,000 pound payload when you consider water or whatever. We have to have an extensive uh, driver training program. So just preventing uh, spill from turnovers and driver accidents. But even on the trucks, we put spill response because there's valves that may get uh, worn out there could be a spill product. And that's where most of ours, and generally speaking, if I, I, we track all our spills, if we have an infield spill, it's generally less than five gallons. If we spill a bag of fertilizer, you try to scrape it up, and we've all seen the problem when you overspill a fertilizer in the mud, you just never can get it all up. And then if should we have a, a, a traffic accident where there is a, a collision of our vehicle with ours, we know there's a potential, particularly with some of the spray trucks that have large, all of our brakes are equipped with spill kits and we go through every year large spill response training. Uh, in many states, they'll allow us to clean up our spills in other states they want us to stay away from it. So we work very closely letting the fire districts know what kind of uh, products we carry. And as I mentioned earlier, typical your spills are fairly low. If you look at it in our payload, uh, somewhere five pounds of grain is about a pound and a half of nitrogen, five gallons of spray mix is about two pounds of nitrogen. Now we're going to get into this later, but I just want to touch on that we do need to look at site factors. What we in here as a lawn care operator in terms of site conditions we can't control. We try to educate consumers about planting desired grasses. When you give them the, the estimate to do a conversion, they kind of back away. It's very hard to justify to a homeowner putting $1,200 in a conversion to a new and improved turf grass variety. So that's human behavior. Soil type, with some of the land management practices, three pounds of nitrogen on an established community is extremely good. But if you give me a new subdivision where the developer stripped off or buried under that A and B horizon soil, try to grow any landscape plan that C horizon with three pounds of nitrogen per thousand. It's not possible. And that's where we get sediment runoff. So we do recognize that certain landscapes require more inputs, but as the lawn matures, yes, they can be reduced. And obviously, slope, weather factors, and then also the product selection itself. I did some studies a bunch of years back, and the thing is, I don't want to lay that out, but again, the assumption that everything that goes on the lawn has the potential to run off. We need to understand some of the product chemistry. And in fertilizers, we're getting to the assumption, and we're in some states, say, well, that you must automatically use slow release nitrogen. Is it data based, or is it assumption based? And, and that's some of the factors we deal with. And when you look at some of the data that I've done looking at worker safety, uh, it's amazing. You gotta look at the product itself. You can't make general statements. And this is what I think, you know, the EPA has to go in their risk model. They gotta look at a lot of factors. And a lot of times it comes down, you shouldn't use pesticides or you're gonna use. So we gotta be careful and understand it. Uh, formulation effects, a similar study. Uh, so we've learned a lot that once applied, once dried onto the surface, these things really don't move off that readily. Then you also recognize that a lot of these products have a dissipation curve over time. So really, if you look at it, you can't just say, well, products are unlikely to lose. You gotta look at the storm interval related to the application site, and then recognize that a lot of these things are gonna bind to the soil over time or actually go through a natural degradation process. Let's think about a simple model here. Lawns, I believe, act as a filter to reduce surface water runoff in the storm water basins. We're not going to eliminate lawns. I do think sometimes homeowners need to look at how they maintain their landscapes. I think some of the stuff I see is kind of crazy. Lawns provide a desirable area. It doesn't need to be, out of that 6,000 square foot of green space, it's got to be automatically all lawn. No one's ever advocating that. But it's hard to change behavior, tell people to put in uh, buffer strip landscape areas near hard goods. So we've got to work with that in a responsible fashion. So really our goal is to manage the lawn to a consumer's degree of satisfaction and then we try to train our people to mitigate adverse environmental impact. That's really what we have to do if we want to be responsible in this community. Now one thing we've learned is that uh, consumers, we talk about this water's edge, we are dealing with a lot of properties in Florida where you know, most land coming out of, of agriculture going into urban, you do, there are rules in place about water runoff from property. So you're seeing more and more impounded bodies of water, stormwater retention basins. People desire to see that area cared for. We have in Florida with the, the fluctuation of those uh, uh, levels, we wanted to be of, out of the way. So I said, let's stay, stay back and create a boundary. Now you may argue three feet, you may argue 10 feet, but 250 feet is not practical. But it's amazing when we were trying to just put a three foot to keep direct product out of the, the water, we had consumers get upset with us on that. 
And I say, well, it's our ring of responsibility.